Hi folks and welcome back. This week we're going to start our discussion of the doctor-patient relationship, or more broadly, the medical professional patient relationship. Uh, and we're going to be thinking about the norms that govern that relationship, or the norms that ought to govern that relationship, uh, about the things that are required for that relationship to function well, to lead to good outcomes, and about the sorts of things that can derail that relationship, can cause it to function poorly. Uh, in this video, I'm going to introduce you to uh, a way of thinking about this relationship and to four models around which we can structure this relationship. These four models that we're going to introduce come from a manual and a manual, uh, and they should be thought of as, um, as stereotypical models uh, of the way this relationship could go. No particular doctor-patient relationship is going to adhere perfectly to one of these models, uh, but we will see elements of these models in any doctor-patient relationship. We'll be able to identify elements of these models. So let's go ahead and get started. I want to begin by asking what these models are. Uh, what are we trying to what are we trying to do when we model the doctor patient relationship in this way? One uh, one way to start thinking about this is to consider some other relationships that you probably have. Uh, think about a friendship or the relationship you have with your with your children or with your parents. Think about the relationship you have with a mechanic. Uh, or the relationship you have uh, with a salesperson when you're purchasing something. Or think about a teacher-student relationship, for example. In all of these relationships, uh, there are two, two key things that we can identify. One is an aim or purpose or telos, and the other is a set of norms that governs this relationship. So when we think about a relationship like a friendship, we think about it as being aimed at some good, right? A friendship aims at camaraderie. It aims at, uh, at, at uh, support, at emotional support or emotional well-being. Uh, it aims at solidarity, uh, at someone who, at having someone who you can rely on in times of need, uh, and someone who you can provide aid to when they are in need. Right? So a relationship has, has these sorts of aims. It may be difficult in some relationships to identify one particular aim, um, but in others it's pretty easy, right? The, the relationship between a mechanic and a car owner, uh, is aimed at a well-functioning car. Right? If the, the relationship fails to bring about a car that is drivable, well-functioning, doesn't break down all the time, then the relationship is, is failing in some way. Uh, so the relationship has this particular aim. Um, and the relationship, by virtue of having that aim, is governed by a set of norms that helps it achieve that aim ways of behaving or ways of acting uh, that we enforce upon one another in order to try to ensure that we can achieve that aim. Uh, and these norms lead to us having certain expectations about one another's behavior when we're engaged in one of these relationships. So think here about friendship. There are certainly ways you expect your friends to behave, certain norms that you think they ought to follow by virtue of being uh, your friend, and if they fail to live up to those norms, you're going to tell them that they're being a bad friend. The sorts of things that someone does that warrants that judgment that they are a bad friend are violations of the constitutive norms of friendship the very norms that make it the relationship that it is. So we want to think about these sorts of norms, right? The sorts of norms that govern a relationship, that make it the relationship that it is, and make it function in a way that is conducive to bringing about the telos or aim of that relationship. So I want to apply these ideas to the physician-patient relationship. What is the aim of the physician-patient relationship, and what norms ought to govern this relationship? Those are the central questions we're going to try to answer. Well, 
let's start by thinking about what the aim is. To answer this question, think about why you go to the doctor. Well, what, what are your reasons for seeking out uh, professional medical help? I mean, there are many. Sometimes you go to the doctor uh, because you're due for your yearly physical. Uh, sometimes you go to the doctor because you've got this rash and you're not exactly sure what it is and you need somebody to, to take a look at it and explain to you what's going on here. Uh, sometimes you go to the doctor uh, because uh, you need to refill a prescription and your doctor won't write a prescription unless you come in for a checkup and pay them that, that 50 bucks for the office visit. Um, you know, so there are all sorts of different reasons you might go to the doctor. But in general, I think we can categorize them into, uh, in, into two or three broad categories. We can say that uh, sometimes you go to the doctor for maintenance of health. Nothing's wrong with you. You don't feel ill. You don't have any particular symptoms that are troubling you. Um, but you're coming in to ensure that there's nothing going on under the radar, uh, to ensure that there's nothing uh, that's going to just come out of the blue. Um, just, just sort of uh, regular checkup and maintenance. Right. Uh, another reason we go to the doctor is because, well, something is wrong. We have some symptoms that we... We don't know what they are. We need some information. We need some diagnostic help. Uh, we need to figure out what these symptoms are so that they can be alleviated. Um, and then the third sort of broad set of reasons is because we do know that something is wrong. We know what it is that's wrong with us. Uh, and we need access to whatever it is that will cure that disease or ailment uh, or repair that injury. I, I know I broke my arm and I need surgery in order to repair it. <laughs> um, I, I have to go to the doctor in order to access that care. Uh, or I know I have a sinus infection and I need antibiotics to cure it. I have to go to the doctor in order to access that cure. That, that cure. Um, so all of these, these, these three categories that I've just identified, uh, we can lump together in one overarching theme. They're all aimed at patient well-being. Right? We go to the doctor in order to achieve well-being, whether it be physical well-being or emotional well-being or psychological well-being. We go to the doctor in order to try to achieve well-being. Uh, we usually go when something's amiss, and so we're not doing well. Uh, but uh, when we go, we hope to cure that. We hope to correct whatever it is that's amiss. So we go with the aim of well-being. And I want to think about that as the aim of the physician-patient relationship. It's always aimed at securing patient well-being in this very broad sense. So how do we get there? How is well-being achieved? Well, the first step, or maybe the final step, depending on how we're approaching this, uh, is to make a medical decision. Uh, because when you go to the doctor and you get some information from your doctor, uh, you have to then decide how to act on that information in order to achieve well-being. Or your doctor has to decide how to act on that information in order to achieve well-being. So a decision is absolutely necessary. It's not like you go to the doctor, they tell you what's wrong, and then all of a sudden you're better, right? You have to decide to try this medicine or that medicine, to try physical therapy or to try surgery. So a decision has to be made. Well, what goes into making a medical decision? What are the inputs that you need in order to, uh, to make a medical decision or come to a medical decision? There are two broad categories of inputs that are necessary here. First, of course, you need the facts. Uh, you need the medical information that is relevant. You need a diagnosis. You need to know what exactly is wrong with you. So you might need uh, some diagnostic tests run in order to figure that out. Uh, you might need the, the doctor's professional knowledge in order to figure that out. You need a prognosis. You need to know what some of the likely outcomes are given what is wrong with you. And you need to know what treatments are available to you. So you're going to need the access to the 
the cutting edge medical research uh, and you're going to need some background knowledge about the human body, about anatomy and biology. Uh, so you need to know what treatments are, what are, are, what are available to you in order to try to correct the ailment that brought you into the doctor in the first place. But medical information alone isn't enough. Simply having the knowledge, uh, having the facts in front of you isn't enough to figure out what to do because those facts may present you with various options uh, and not necessitate any one of those particular options. You need to apply your values or your preferences to those facts. You need to know what matters to you. You need to know what your desired outcomes are, because if you don't have those desired outcomes, then no particular plan of action is called for. No particular plan of action is necessitated. It's only once we put facts and values together that a decision can be made. It's only once we put our knowledge about the world together with our understanding of our preferences, our subjective preferences, that a decision can be made. So we need facts and we need the patient's values in order to reach a decision. And this gives us a kind of simple model for thinking about the doctor-patient relationship and the decision-making process that is central to that relationship. The relationship is aimed at patient well-being. It achieves patient well-being via a medical decision and it uh, reaches that medical decision by integrating the patient's values and the doctor's knowledge, the medical facts of the case. To get those facts, to get that knowledge, uh, we need to analyze the evidence. We need to analyze the symptoms that you are presenting with. Uh, that may require things like diagnostic tests. It may require things like access to medical research. It may require things like certain background knowledge that the doctor has by virtue of her training. And all of this needs to be built into the decision. So we get the analysis of evidence on the facts side leading to the knowledge that the doctor brings to bear. At least for now, we're going to make the assumption that the doctor brings that knowledge to bear. We'll, we'll poke at that assumption in just a bit, um, but that the doctor brings to bear. And we need the patient's values and preferences that get plugged in in order to achieve a medical decision. All right, so we've got this simple model of the relationship now. Now we need to think about the various ways in which this model can be realized, various ways in which it can be put into practice. And what we're going to focus on in particular is this bit about patient values. Uh, how, do we, how do we integrate patient values and the knowledge that the physician has in order to achieve this medical decision, in order to arrive at this medical decision? Well, Emmanuel and Emmanuel give us four models uh, that realize this simple model in a variety of different ways, uh, governed by different sets of norms. They give us the paternalistic model, the informative model, the interpretive model, and the deliberative model. So let's look at these in turn. The paternalistic model is uh, had for a very long time, been the dominant model by which medicine was proffered, uh, not just historically in the United States, but really globally. Uh, a paternalistic model uh, makes one big assumption, one central assumption. It assumes that the physician can know the relevant patient values. And the basis of that assumption is the idea that the patient inhabits what I like to call the, the sick role. We all learn to inhabit this role uh, from very early on in our lives. Uh, we all learn to inhabit this role and it's reinforced on us throughout our lives when we're children uh, and we fall down and get hurt or we uh, we aren't feeling well. We seek out someone to help us, and we're told to tell our family, to tell our parents, to tell our caregivers when something's not right, when we need help. Right? My two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old now, you know, for 
Anytime he gets a boo-boo, anytime he falls down and scrapes his knee, he comes running to get mommy or daddy to kiss it to make it better. Actually, about the last three months or so, he started kissing it himself. <laughs> um, so he's learning to, to practice some self-care. <laughs> um, but we learn to inhabit this sick role. We learn to seek out the care of others. You know, I'm 37 years old and I still call my mom when I'm not feeling well. Like, what should I take for this? <laughs> right? Um, we still seek out someone else to help us. The paternalistic model assumes that that's what's going on when you come to the doctor. You're sick. You don't feel well. You have some symptoms. So you come to the doctor seeking out care. And so the doctor can assume that what you want is whatever kind of care is going to be necessary in order to make you feel better, in order to make you well. That's the assumption that the doctor makes. That's the big assumption that underlies the paternalistic model. So the doctor can assume that since you're here, since you showed up at the hospital, you showed up in the emergency room, you showed up at the doctor's office, we can assume that you're seeking the kind of care that will make you well. Now, this model is guided by beneficence. Recall the four, uh, four principles of bioethics. Beneficence was one of those principles. Beneficence is the idea that the doctor ought to act in the patient's best interest, always ought to do what she believes is in the patient's best interest. So the paternalistic model isn't the doctor acting on their own values, acting on their own interests or preferences. It's doing what they judge to be in the patient's best interest, what they think the patient really wants or would want if they were acting rationally. To do otherwise wouldn't be the paternalistic model. It would be what Emmanuel and Emmanuel call an instrumental model. It would be using the patient for the doctor's own benefit, either to put more money in their pockets <laughs> uh, or to do research uh, that uh, will benefit the doctor or benefit society, but not necessarily the patient. Now, this instrumental model has been used historically. It's the model that we see in, for example, the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. Um, but that's not what we're talking about here. No one thinks that that is a model that ought to be adopted. Um, the paternalistic model, though, has the patient's best interests in mind. Now, there are some, some nuances that we need to pick up on here. The, the, the paternalistic model doesn't reject the ideal of autonomy. The patient still is in control. It's just that the patient's control is very limited. The, pa the doctor is not going to act without the patient assenting or giving uh, informed consent to uh, perform whatever procedures the doctor thinks needs to be performed. So patient assent is still required, but that's pretty much the limit of autonomy on this model. It's, it's a very thin, very, very thin notion of autonomy. Um, in order to achieve what they judge to be the best outcome, the paternalistic physician may even withhold some information or frame some information in particular ways uh, so that they get the, they, they convince the patient to act or to make the choice that they think is in their best interest. Uh, so you know, we know, for example, that if someone receives really, really traumatic information, a really traumatic diagnosis, uh, and a really traumatic prognosis, that could lead to worse outcomes because it can lead to depression and it can lead to uh, a, a deteriorating mental state, which would lead to worse medical outcomes. And so a doctor, a paternalistic doctor, might might cushion the blow, might not. Uh, be so upfront about the prognosis. A paternalistic doctor also might recognize that uh, the risks of a surgery might scare someone off from getting a surgery that the doctor really truly believes is in their best interest, and so might uh, not uh, highlight those risks, might not make them so apparent, in order to ensure that the patient makes the decision that the doctor judges is best. So, what are some problems with this, a paternal, with this paternalistic model? Well, one big problem is the central assumption that it makes. Um, we certainly 
uh, we certainly don't always go to the doctor because we want to cure whatever is wrong with us. Sometimes we simply want information. We want knowledge. We want a second opinion. Sometimes uh, we go because uh, we judge that um, the pain that we are going to suffer in trying to cure whatever ails us is too great, and we want to be in a position to control how the end of our lives go. We want palliative care, or we want to seek out assisted suicide. These are all reasons for going to the doctor. Uh, and maybe we don't want the most aggressive treatment, but we still want to try to, um, try to treat the ailment that we are suffering from. Not everyone who goes to the doctor is seeking the same outcomes. We have different values, different preferences, different risk profiles. Uh, and so we should reject this big assumption that the paternalistic model makes. It's simply not the case that the doctor can know what our values are. Now, historically, maybe it was closer to the truth that the doctor could know these things for two really big reasons. One is that there simply wasn't that much that medicine could do. There simply wasn't that much that the doctor or the, the, the medical practitioner could offer you. Uh, so the options were limited. There weren't really that many choices to make. Second, uh, the doctor, the physician, the medical practitioner was often someone who was embedded in your own community. They probably had the same religious beliefs that you did. They probably had the same social values that you did. They probably uh, grew up in the same community that you grew up in. And so they probably knew you very well, and they probably knew what was important to you. They probably knew what you valued most. And so they probably could make a judgment on your behalf that would, in fact, be in your best interest, in the way that we think a parent can often make a judgment on a child's behalf that is in their best interest. But that's simply not the case in modern medicine. Now we have many options to offer. Uh, uh, there are probably too many options to offer. And medicine is institutionalized and offered on a consumer model. You might not see the same doctor twice. You might not see the same doctor. Or you, might, you might see your doctor only once a year. They might come from a very different background than you. They might come uh, live in a very different community than you. They certainly have a very different education than you. Uh, and so um, we can't assume that they're going to understand what the patient's values are. So these are pretty strong reasons for rejecting this paternalistic model as the model of the doctor-patient relationship or the ideal model of the doctor-patient relationship. And we saw this manifest uh, over the course of the patient's rights movement from really the 1960s through the 1990s, uh, pushing for patients' bill of rights, pushing for uh, patients to, uh, to, for doctors to more openly communicate diagnostic information and uh, prognostic information to their patients, uh, to allow patients to make more informed decisions about their care. Uh, we pushed away from this paternalistic model. So I want to turn next to the model that we end up with. So once we reject the paternalistic model, uh, the model that we've turned to is uh, what Emmanuel and Emmanuel call the informative model. This model, rather than centering beneficence, centers the principle of autonomy. Autonomy here is thought of in a very capacious sense, that is, in a sense that um, that is that is wide open, right? That the individual, the patient, gets to make the decision for themselves, whether we think it's a good decision, a bad decision, a rational decision, an irrational decision. That doesn't matter. What matters is that the patient is able to choose, that their choices are not interfered with by the doctor or anyone else. The patient is wholly in control of their medical care 
on this informative model. This is the dominant model today. It's a very consumeristic model of medicine. It thinks of medical care as being provided in just the same way uh, that other consumer goods are provided. We show up fully informed and decide for ourselves what we need, and then the doctor, uh, with their technical expertise, provides the care that is required. Um, so it rejects the assumption that uh, patient values can be known by the physician. Uh, it um, instead uh, thinks that only the patient can know his or her own values. Right? Only the patient knows their own values. Only the patient knows what they want, what they prefer, what they desire. The doctor simply can't know this. It's going to be dependent on an individual's religious beliefs. It's going to be dependent on an individual's upbringing, on their economic circumstances, on their family circumstances. There's so much that's going to uh, inform the preferences that someone has that the doctor simply can't make any assumptions about what those preferences are. And since the doctor can't make any assumptions about what those preferences are, they ought not to presume that they know what is in the patient's best interest. Only the patient can make that decision. As such, the doctor is tasked with providing information and exercising their technical expertise. They are the ones who went to medical school. They're the ones who read the medical journals and stay up to date on the research. They're the ones who have the background knowledge that can be brought to bear on the symptoms that the patient is presenting with in order to arrive at a diagnosis, a prognosis, and possible treatment plans. And so the doctor provides that information and then the patient themselves, or maybe in consultation with their family or friends, makes a decision about what to do and the doctor executes that decision. The doctor uses their technical expertise in order to execute the decision that the patient has made. Patients on this model are consumers, doctors are providers, uh, and, and the relationship is boiled down to uh, a relationship of consumer exchange. Uh, that's how we understand the medical relationship. I often think of this model as the Dr. Google model or the WebMD model. Um, besides the fact that doctors can do surgeries and write prescriptions, which Google can't do yet, <laughs> um, this model often treats physicians as as we treat Google, right? We come for this information, give us this information, uh, and we'll make the decision then on our own what to do with this information. We don't want anything more from you. We don't want you to tell us what's in our best interest. We don't want you to presume that you know what our values are, what our preferences are. We just want you to give us the information so that we can make a decision. So it's the Dr. Google model of the doctor-patient relationship. Now, it's the dominant model today, but it certainly doesn't sound ideal to us, right? It certainly doesn't meet, uh, meet our expectation that a physician is in some way a caring individual, someone who we turn to for support. It certainly doesn't meet our idea uh, or ideal that um, the doctor-patient relationship is in some way a special relationship. It's not a relationship like you have with the clerk at at uh, 7-Eleven or the relationship that you have with your barber or hairstylist. It's something, uh, something more special, more important, more central to our lives than that, not just in the sense that the decisions we make are more momentous, but that we expect more from this relationship. We want more from it. Um, and the informative model doesn't allow for that. Um, it also makes... Uh, some problematic assumptions. The informative model presumes that, or assumes, I'm sorry, assumes that patients uh, have stable values that are transparent to them, that they know what's important to them, uh, and that they can consult uh, that list of values in order to reach a decision. Um, I often think that, that the, the informative model 
treats patients as sims. If you've ever played the game, you know, sims get this little bubble that pops up behind their head and tells you what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they need, things like that, right? That, that we're walking around with this little bubble up here uh, that has our values uh, imposed on it. Uh, and if we're ever confused about what our values are, if we're ever not sure how to make a decision, we simply consult the bubble. We look up and say, oh yeah, that's what's important to me. And so we can make a decision in that way. But we're not Sims. We're not like that. Our values are, are not always so transparent to us. We're not always sure what they are, what's most important to us, until we're pushed to reflect upon them, until we're put in a situation where we have to really think hard about what's important to us. They're not just transparent. We might actually be pretty... Uh, they, they might be pretty hidden from us. They might be pretty opaque to us. Uh, in many circumstances, we may be very unsure about what's important. And they're also not so stable. I often think here of, of my, my college football coach, Coach Streeter, who was, uh, you know, a wonderful person, wonderful coach. Um, and he'd give this, this, uh, this speech at least three or four times a season, usually after a loss, and we lost a lot. Uh, and he'd talk about what, what your values should be and how you should approach, uh, hardship. And you, you gotta keep your values in mind and your values should be faith, family, football, and then everything else. And I often thought, like, must be really easy for you to live your life if you're so clear about what your values are and they're so stable for you, faith, family, football, and then everything else. I ain't like that, right? I, my values are not that stable. They're often in flux. They're going to change dependent on the information that I have at hand. They're going to change dependent on my present circumstances and mood. Uh, and they're certainly going to change if I get you know, a cancer diagnosis. They're, they're going to fluctuate in response to this incoming information. They're not just stable and transparent such that I can consult them anytime I need to. Yet the informative model makes this assumption. They assume that patients on their own can figure out what their values are and that they're stable enough that they can just apply them to this information that is given to them. But Illness interposes the body between, or the body and mind, really, between the patient and reality. That is, illness gets in the way of our making uh, well-informed decisions and applying our values. Because when we are ill, we often aren't thinking clearly. We don't have enough energy uh, to think through uh, the consequences of our decisions. We don't have uh, enough energy to do the research that we might need to do. Uh, we are scared, anxious, depressed, and so not necessarily acting on our standing values, but maybe acting on our most immediate inclinations or passions uh, that are not uh, our reflective values or our true self, but rather uh, what uh, we are led to do simply because we are so scared right now or because we are so anxious right now. The empathy mapping exercise that we did it should have should should make this this very apparent to you that when you receive a diagnosis like this, uh, or when you are in a medical circumstance like this, uh, your values may not be clear to you. Uh, your thinking might be muddled. You might not be able to rationally choose what you ought to do, what's in your best interest. The informative model makes no room for the physician to try to help you with that decision, to try to help you figure out what your values are and try to apply them. And finally, this idea of autonomy is non-interference. We're going to discover that maybe far too capacious a sense of autonomy. Autonomy may not be best understood simply as non-interference. It may not be the case that what we need in order to act autonomously is for others to simply stay out of our way. Rather, what we need in order to be able to act autonomy is for others to help us test our values, to help us form our thoughts and, and uh, generate judgments about possible courses of action. Uh, we may need others to provide certain resources that support our autonomy. So we may need the help of others to act autonomously. And the informative model doesn't leave any room for that at all because it understands autonomy merely as non-interference. So can we do better? 
well, yeah, we can do a little bit better. Um, one model that Emmanuel and Emmanuel propose is what they call the interpretive model of the physician-patient relationship. On this interpretive model, we understand that patient values are opaque and unstable, uh, that they may change in response to illness or injury, that they may be in flux, uh, and that patients may not be in a position to, cer to know with certainty what their values are. Um, but we don't presume that the physician can know what those values are. Rather, the physician inhabits the role of a kind of counselor who helps to clarify what the patient's values are and match them to particular treatment plans. Patient values are still central on this account. It's not that the physician's values are somehow transplanted for them or that we can assume we know what they are, but the physician is tasked with having a kind of conversation with the patient where they try to draw out what these values are. They might lay out different possible treatment plans and say, you know, if we take this more aggressive path uh, where we try an aggressive form of chemotherapy and an aggressive uh, regimen of, um, of radiation post-surgery, uh, then um, there are, you know, the, these are the, the, the slim chances that it will be successful. Here's how likely it is to be successful. Uh, but if uh, you are in a position in your life where you think the most important thing you can do is fight for uh, any chance that you have at survival, then this is the path that you probably should take. If you have a young child at home uh, and you want to be able to, to care for that child and watch them grow up, or if you have uh, a grandchild coming and you want to be able to survive to meet that grandchild, this is the path that we should take, right? And so if those are what your values are fighting for as many days as you can. This is what we can do. But if, you're, if you value uh, your present well-being, if you want to be able to spend as many, uh, many good days as you can get with your family where you're feeling good and you have strength to interact with them, and you think that those are more important than trying to extend your life uh, with try, then reaching for that very slim chance of extending your life, then we can take this less aggressive path. We can use these less aggressive treatments that still give you a chance at recovery, but that are uh, you know, a smaller chance at recovery, but that aren't going to interfere as much with your day-to-day -day life right now. Um, that would be a kind of example of the way an interpretive physician might present options to a patient trying to elicit what their values are and then match those values to possible treatments. It's a way of supporting the patient's autonomy, helping them to see how different options fit with their values and helping them to understand what their values are. But the interpretive model, again, is not uh, is not perfect, all right? Uh, it, again, doesn't fit with this ideal of a caring physician. We sometimes want doctors to encourage us to adopt healthier habits, uh, to value our health more, uh, to perhaps uh, convince us that the thing to do is not to try the most aggressive treatment because the chances are so slim. Um, we think that that's a role that physicians ought to play, that they ought to be caring that that this relationship of care that they have entered into with us uh, is one that requires them to consider what's in our best interest and try to convince us of that. You know, we want the doctor to tell us to stop smoking, uh, to tell us to have fewer drinks uh, during the week, or to wear a helmet when we're riding our bike, or wear a seatbelt when we're in our car, right? We, we want the, the doctor that's going to do that. Um, it's also really an inefficient model. Right? One of the things about the informative model that is that, that, that is so appealing about it is that it is incredibly efficient from the perspective of the physician and those who train physicians and employ physicians. Uh, it limits the liability of the physician because uh, they're not trying to insert their values in any way, shape, or form. Their only uh, task is to provide information. Uh, it uh, means that they can spend just a few minutes with a patient and give them the information and then move on and not have to go through this process of trying to help them interpret their values, uh, which could take 
you know, hours and hours over many visits to try to help them do. Um, the, the medical system as it is set up today is not set up for us to do this. It's not set up in a way where, pa where physicians can spend that much time with patients and still keep the lights on. They can spend 15 minutes tops with each patient if they want to keep their lights on, if they want to keep billing insurance for enough to keep their practice running. Uh, it also uh, is the case that insurance companies require physicians to see a certain number of patients per day if they want to be in plan or in network with their plans. Uh, physicians simply cannot operate without uh, operating efficiently. Um, and uh, the interpretive model doesn't fit that aspect of the way we've set up our healthcare system. So it would require a pretty wholesale change in the way we set up medical care in this country or healthcare in this country. Um, doctors also aren't trained to do this, right? We expect doctors to be specialists in their field. We expect our cardiologists to be studying uh, the, the heart and the circulatory system and focused on that. We expect our neurologists to be studying the brain and be focused on that. We don't want them to also have to be counselors. We they have to go to school for another year or two in order to do this? Where is it going to fit into, uh, into training for medical practice and who's going to pay the bills in order for them to get this sort of training? Um, medic medicine itself uh, and, and medical practice itself probably self-selects for people who aren't as good uh, at, uh, at this sort of task. If they were really gifted in this way, they might be psychiatrists or psychologists or counselors rather than doctors. That's not to say that no doctors are good at this, um, but that many people who go into medical professions are highly technically skilled, but maybe lack some of these people skills. So it's not clear that this model fits very well. Uh, with, um, with, with the way that the medical system is set up or the type of people who go into medical practice, who often go into medical practice. There's also a real worry here that the interpretive model could slide back into paternalism. Uh, the worry is that if patients expect doctors to be helping them to interpret their values, if the norms of the relationship are such that patients form the expectation that doctors are going to help them interpret their values, uh, then it opens the door to doctors either um, purposefully or more likely unintentionally interpreting patient values in the ways that they see fit. They'll kind of guide the patient toward the, the treatments that they think are best for them, or maybe that are best for the doctor because they're more efficient treatments. Uh, the, in, and the patient won't be on the lookout for this to happen because their expectations are such that the doctor is simply helping them um, interpret what their values are. So again, can we do any better? Well, Emmanuel and Emmanuel offer one final model. They call this the deliberative model of the doctor-patient relationship. And if we look at this model, we see that something important changes here. Uh, doctor's values now come into play and interact with patient values on this deliberative model. So the idea of the deliberative model is the idea that the doctor acts as a kind of friend or as a kind of um, as a kind of teacher uh, in the circumstances uh, of making a decision with the patient, in consultation with the patient, in partnership with the patient. So the doctor may in fact try to influence what the patient does, may in fact try to convince the patient uh, of what a best outcome looks like or of what the best treatment options for them look like. Uh, and uh, do this through a deliberative conversation where they test out the patient's values. They hold the patient's values up and say, hey, uh, here's what I hear you saying, but let me push on that a little bit. Is that really what's in your best interest? Is that really the best way to achieve the goals that you have? Let's challenge it a little bit. Let's have these hard conversations. Look, I know that you think the best thing to do is to take this most aggressive path to try to treat your cancer, but look, it's going to be really difficult on you. It's going to be really 
torturous for you and the likelihood of success is really slim and i don't think that you should place so much value on simply extending your life i think you ought to think more about having a good quality of life now of living for today and getting the most that you can out of life and here's why i think that's important right that's the sort of way a deliberative physician might approach uh, a conversation with a patient so they bring their own values to bear in the conversation. This allows them to be the caring physician uh, that we seek out. Uh, it allows them to, um, uh, to try to convince the patient uh, of the sort of care that they ought to seek out rather than merely sitting back and letting them make the decision. It also, in, in, a, in a kind of um, surprising way protects against the slide back into paternalism because the, the deliberative model is very open about the fact that the doctor is trying to influence the patient's decisions. And so the patient is not caught unawares. The patient is not going to be surprised by a doctor doing this, uh, and is going to be prepared to try to uh, to, to defend the values that they're bringing to bear in their decision. So on the deliberative model, the doctor brings to bear their expertise, but also has a conversation with the patient about what their values are. And then it's the doctor's and patient's values together, along with the doctor's expertise that are integrated into a medical decision. Now we should note that this also uh, doesn't require as much of the doctors by way of treating them as a kind of counselor because it's not asking doctors to be unhuman in some way. It's not asking doctors to, uh, to box off their own values and preferences and hide them away while they try to help a patient figure out what's in their best interest. Rather, it's asking them to be particularly human in this instance, to be in, to enter into a relationship that they would enter into with their family or their friends, the kind of relationship that we're all used to entering into, where we do question one another's values and preferences, where we do challenge each other to give reasons in support of our values and preferences. So it's actually uh, a more reasonable thing to ask doctors to do. They don't need special training for this. They just need to be human in order to do this. The ideal, uh, the, uh, the, the deliberative model is constructed around a notion of autonomy uh, that is understood as moral self-development or moral self-governance for uh, a manual and a manual. Uh, I want to think about it in terms of moral self-governance, and I'm going to have a lot more to say about this in the next video. Um, but for now, I want to recognize that autonomy requires uh, not just acting on what your present values or preferences or interests are, but requires acting on values that pass the test of reason, as I'm going to put it, or acting on one's true desires uh, or rational desires, not on a passing whim, not on what one's present desires are, but what, uh, what one's desires are or interests are or values are upon deep reflection on those values. And we need the help of another to reflect on our values. We need someone to challenge them, someone to push us in order to reflect upon our values. And that's what the deliberative model allows for. The doctor inhabits the role of that individual who's going to push uh, us to reflect upon our values. Now, it's not a perfect model, once again. Um, the deliberative model raises some worries. One, it's, it's difficult and demanding. Um, surely it requires only that doctors be human, but it requires that they be good humans, and not all of us are good humans. Not all of us are good at having these sorts of conversations. It's a difficult and demanding thing to do. It's emotionally and psychologically draining to do. Um, it's also inefficient. It requires a lot of time spent with doctors. 
Uh, it requires a lot of time or with patients, it can't be done in a mere 15 minute visit. Uh, and so again, it doesn't fit with our present model, uh, our consumeristic model of, of uh, providing medical care in the country, uh, in the US, it, uh, it would require a wholesale change of that model, it would require reform. If we think that this is the way that doctors really ought to interact with patients, if we think that this is what is necessary, then we need to reform the system. Um, we also might worry that we don't go to the doctor to have our values judged. Right? We might worry that <laughs> that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to get your care, not to get you to, uh, to judge what my interests or values are. This is particularly, um, particularly important when we think of issues like abortion. Um, we, we don't necessarily want a healthcare provider uh, trying to convince a patient not to get an abortion when they've judged that's what's in their best interest or to not uh, go on birth control when they've judged what's that, what, that's what's in their best interest because the healthcare provider thinks that um, that's not something that a woman should do. Uh, so um, there, there are worries here and we need to think and, and we will think about how to uh, to approach the deliberative model in a nuanced way to uh, to try to alleviate some of these worries. Um, and again, we might worry about the slide to paternalism, though, as I said, it's not as pronounced as it is with the interpretive model. Um, now, Emmanuel and Emmanuel identify the deliberative model as the ideal model of the doctor-patient relationship. And I want to take just a second now to say what they mean by that. It is the ideal model in the sense that this is the model that you work with unless you find yourself in circumstances where this model won't work. So you begin with the deliberative model. You, stri you, you strive to enact the deliberative model. But if you find yourself in circumstances where the deliberative model won't work, you have to justify your deviation from this model by appeal to those circumstances in which you found yourself. So, for example, uh, if you are uh, a, um, a an emergency room uh, doctor and someone's brought in and they're unconscious and bleeding, uh, you you don't try to deliberate with them about what kind of care uh, they need. Rather, you provide that care in a paternalistic way uh, in order to try to restore their ability to make decisions for themselves, and then you deliberate with them about their long-term care. Uh, if you have a patient who is incompetent because they are suffering from dementia, clearly the deliberative model is not going to work, although you may enact it with their family. When you approach them in particular, th them themselves, you may need to adopt a paternalistic model. And you can justify deviation from the deliberative model in this way. The deliberative model is also the ideal according to, or is the ideal according to Emmanuel and Emmanuel, because it respects a sense of autonomy and is built around a sense of autonomy uh, that is robust and that has a long history in the Western philosophical tradition. A sense of autonomy uh, that arises out of the thinking of a philosopher by the name of Immanuel Kant, who I will introduce you to in the next video, uh, where we talk in particular about this robust notion of autonomy. Um, and I want to leave you here with this short, uh, short uh, handout, <laughs> in essence, uh, that gives you an idea of how the four models fit together and some of the key points about these models. This will also be available to you on Blackboard. So until next time, take care of yourselves, uh, and I will uh, I will be posting new videos soon.